Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and I thought it'd be fun this week to do a little bit of a show and tell of some of the uh, collectibles and objects I have in my office space, as well as a model behavior project, which we really haven't done uh, or shown since we've been working from home in the lockdown. Uh, now, I am a big collector of uh, six scale figures, of Mecha, of Gundam, of all sorts of toys, and um, I wanted to put a spotlight on one of the companies that I really, really love. Now, you may remember about six years ago, Adam and I uh, showed off this really beautiful undead cosmonaut figure. This orange uh, spacesuit, had the skull inside, and that was based off of the work of Ashley Wood, an artist who created this line of figures called 3A, the world of 3A. And it took his unique style of Mecca, of this post-apocalyptic robotic wasteland, uh, and then turn those into these wonderfully detailed, poseable, mixed-media uh, toys. Now, those of you who follow the collectibles business may have heard that as of last summer, last July, Ashwood announced that he was shutting down 3A, and so while he's still going to create art, there would be no more of those figures. But fortunately, the company that makes the toys, which is a spinoff of 3A called 3.0, still exists and inherited all of the licenses from uh, things that they've been working on, like Ashwood's interpretation of uh, Marvel characters, Iron Man, Spider-Man, oh, I love that Spider-Man mecha, uh, to more recent licenses like Transformers. And uh, one of my favorite interpretations of Transformers came from the live action Bumblebee film that Travis Knight directed a couple of years ago. And so that's what we're gonna show off today. Uh, these were our first release under the 3A brand, but now you can find them on places like Sideshow Collectibles or Big Bad Toy Store if you search under 3.0. And uh, this is their line of what they call DLX scale figures. Now, because Transformers aren't the size of humans, it's not like 1 6 scale is 12 inches, you know, 1 10th or 1 12th scale, 6 inches. It's just, it's called DLX scale, which is the smaller of the two scales they're working with, even though something like this is already about 9 inches tall. They're going to also make one of these, I think it's like 15 inches tall. That's way out of budget and space for what I have. But I, I'm such a big fan of this interpretation of Bumblebee and this figure specifically. It is uh, die cast metal, so zinc metal, as you'd find in many like Hot Toys die cast pieces. Extremely poseable, something that's always been a hallmark of the 3A and 3.0 toy lines is the uh, posability. And because they're robots, they can hide so much of that joint work uh, inside the physical design of the toy, of the characters. So even things like the knee here, that's completely poseable. You have things like even the toe right here, very, very sturdy. Uh, it's one of those things that you actually have to be kind of careful when even posing it because of how rigid these pieces are. Um, if you turn like a shoulder a certain way, some of the pieces can bump into each other. And so you sometimes have to pop out a shoulder piece and then get in. But you have all this rotation, uh, lots of interchangeable accessories. So you do get things like an alternate bumblebee head. Uh, there are lights inside his head as well, uh, but the headlamps don't unfortunately light up. That's just clear plastic. Um, and one of my favorite things also about their production is just the, the paint job. I think they do an astounding job with the quality of the paint finish, not only for the metallic parts, uh, but also on this candy coated car paint, uh, the weathering on there. If you look, you can just see that grime that looks like Bumblebee's been you know, stepping right into out of a, a battle scene um, and it just builds up in all the right places and it's just a, a consistency and a quality here that I think uh, is some of the best I've seen. Uh, it doesn't transform and that's you know, fine compromise. I think it would be very difficult for them to design this to actually transform and retain this level of detail. Um, and after I picked this Bumblebee up, I had to pick up some of the other ones as well. And I think just, just released, this one's amazing. It's of course Optimus. It is 
such a better interpretation of Optimus than in the first few live action Transformer films. Um, I think Travis Knight's just his his uh, appreciation for the Gen 1 Transformer design, I think really comes through here, but very modernized as well. You see all that mechanical detail uh, in the places that you would never see in the cell, you know, in the cell cartoon, but including the back here. Oh, this is just a wonderful, wonderful interpretation of Transformers. But my favorite one um, actually is the Decepticon and it's Blitzwing. I saw this at Comic-Con last year and uh, when I did, was walking through the floor and I said, I, I gotta pick this up. And so this is Blitzwing. He's of course, uh, this is set in the early 90s. So he's a, a F4 Phantom II jet as well as I think a tank as well. He's only in the film for like, you know, the first major Earth battle, uh, but just an incredible, incredible design. It has actually a lot of, in the, with the paint scheme, a lot of uh, Gundam characteristics uh, that I really like. And this one's about 11 inches tall. Again, extremely poseable, die cast, accessories. You can swap out his blaster here for the hand. Very poseable lights in here as well as well as his wings. Um, but one thing I noticed when I opened this out of the box and started posing and taking photographs of him was that I thought while the paint job was incredible, it could be even more weathered, even grimier, even more buildup of the illusion of dirt and oil and rust. And so the model behavior today is taking Blitzwing and putting some oil paint on him. Now that may sound blasphemous to some of you out there who are spending, you know, 150 upwards of $200 on a collectible to then put more paint on it, but I'm here to tell you that is totally fine. Don't be so precious about it. You can make this more your own and in fact Painting these type of collectibles is some of the easiest ways to get into weathering uh, as a practice because the, the most of the work's already done. If you look at how great these characters look and these figures look out of the box, they're 90, 95% the way there. All you're doing is adding that extra bit of you know, grime and you can go as far as you want. And the great thing is these come pre-sealed. So you're not gonna be taking off any of the original work. If you make a mistake with the oil paint, if you go a direction that you don't feel completely happy with, you can always just use some paint thinner and get and wipe that right off and you won't damage the original paint job. So if you've watched past episodes of Model Behavior, you'll know that weathering with oil paints is super easy, super forgiving, and really satisfying a process. Uh, you've seen us do it before on the show. You've seen Adam do it recently on his live streams, but all you need are a couple paint brushes, some oil paint. I chose some black and some burnt umber, uh, some paint thinner, and uh, rags or paper towels to wipe off some of those washes and well, let's take a look at the process. So before I got started, one of the things I did was do some test painting on one of the accessories, which I recommend because if you're nervous about committing the paint to the figure itself, about how it may interact with the existing paint finish, because you never know how the, the sealing worked. And one of the great things about working with a figure and collectible like this is that there are plenty of accessories. And so I just took one aside, put some oil paint on that, wiped it off, and it worked really well, which gave me confidence to then go right to Blitzwing here. And I started with his wings uh, because there's nice big pieces that I knew I wanted to get extra grime onto the rivets in the back. And if it was a place that uh, I ended up being not super happy with, it wasn't gonna be prominently displayed in the front of the figure. The application process is really simple. 
uh, putting some paint onto the palette. You don't need to use a lot. A little bit does go a long way. And I'm putting a little bit of paint on the brush and then dipping it into uh, my little canister of paint thinner. And not using a ton of paint thinner, I think a lot of this is finding that balance between how much you want to thin your oil paint and then how then that might apply onto uh, the surface you're working on. pushing a lot of the oil into the corners, into the crevices, painting over these, uh, these seam lines, uh, places where I think there will be grime and there should be grime to build up, and then also letting it sit for a little bit uh, before then wiping it off with a paper towel. In most cases, when working with either figures like these characters or things like spaceships, uh, there's going to be a lot of symmetry. You're going to have two halves with a lot of uh, similar parts on the left and right side. And so one thing I'm keeping in mind as I'm going through this is working on both sides at the same time so that I can match the left and the right side. Not just do one side first and then try to match it, but go with one wing and then the other wing and then move on the one arm, the other arm, one leg, the other leg, and so on. I'm using basically just one brush for this process and just mixing it with the black, mixing it with the burnt umber, thinning it out as I go. And then I have a second brush here that's really more for just the paint thinner. And if there are places where I've let the oil sit for too long and it's building up in an uneven way, or maybe it's built up into a nook and cranny that's really tough to get my rag or paper towel into, uh, that I can use the second brush, dip it in a little bit of paint thinner and use it to move the oil around to make it a little bit more even. And this is where I use to really blend the edges of the oil so it looks like it's something that's part of the original paint job as well. One thing you can easily do that I'm not doing here is uh, do some oil streaks. Now, if you're painting something like uh, a droid or an old vehicle that's supposed to look like the oil or grime is kind of dripped down the sides, again, super easy, similar process where you can use one brush uh, and just draw a, a streak down vertically, kind of along gravity where uh, liquid would be going down, uh, let it sit for a couple minutes, and then taking a second brush, dipping it in some paint thinner, and then using that to kind of thin out that streak and making it look like a very light streak and blending it with those base coats and the previous coats of paint beneath it. Like I mentioned, 90 to 95% of the work is already there in most cases. I'm not trying to remove the existing weathering, I'm trying to add to it and find places where uh, in their manufacturing process, I thought they could have used a little bit more weathering or maybe trying to hide uh, a mold line uh, from the die cast uh, injection molding that may be uh, popping up in, in here or there and hide some of those seams and looking at the color blocking because a character like Blitzwing here, he has these bold reds that stand out against basically two or three tones of, of gray uh, and light gray, um, but there's not a lot of uh, brown in here. So while I don't wanna overwhelm the paint job with uh, what would look like rust, uh, there are definitely places where I think it needs a little bit of a spot of brown to just add some more depth to the color palette. So after about an hour, hour and a half of weathering, uh, I am so much happier with how Blitzwing looks and I think the difference really shows in some of the close-ups and in the photos I'm able to take of this character. Um, and 
oil is super forgiving. So if you know a day later you're looking at it under different light conditions or take pictures of your camera or your phone and you realize, ah, you, maybe I put too much or maybe the color balance doesn't really work, uh, you can always just take some paint thinner. You can always still move some of the oil around um, and you can hide a lot of those crimes or undo a lot of what you did if you're not happy with it. But I am super pleased with how this turned out. And once again, just so impressed by the quality of work, the level of detail, the paint finish out of the box, the engineering and the manufacturing quality of this line of DLX figures from 3.0 now, formerly uh, 3A for the Transformers license. Uh, go check them out uh, and their other figures that they put out. And I'd love to see uh, the paint jobs that you put on your own model making projects, whether they're existing figures that already come painted out of the box or things um, like Gundam or whatever you're working on. Uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, and we'll be back next time with more show and tells and more projects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.